Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Do you ever have that feeling that you're about to be found out any moment? That sense that soon enough people are going to realise that you have absolutely no idea what you're doing. I know I do. So I grew up not going to church, became a Christian as a teenager, and now I'm a vicar. I mean, what has gone on there? I am absolutely convinced that at some point the Church of England are going to realise that they've accidentally ordained me. And you may have your own imposter syndrome, as it's called, whether it's parenthood or in your workplace or this new phenomenon on Zoom where you can be dressed for work on the top and still in your pyjamas on the bottom. And I'm kind of joking, but I'm not really because... The reality is that this imposter syndrome, which is defined as a collection of feelings of inadequacy that persist despite evident success, imposter syndrome steals our joy. It compromises our confidence and it's just exhausting. And it's exhausting because at its root, it's indicative of us trying to do things in our own strength. You know, trying to cover up, trying to fake it until you make it trying to work hard enough for long enough so that you can convince people that you really do have it all together. And I believe that there is an invitation to each of us to a different way, to trust not in our own strength, but in the one who is totally trustworthy. Specifically, three things. To trust in God's promises to you, to trust in God's grace over you, and to trust in God's love for you. And I believe that when we do these things, when we get this trust down, we're set free from expectation, we're set free from fear, from doubt, from striving, and we're released to be the people that we were truly meant to be. So let's look at Psalm 33. Psalm 33 opens with this praise and worship. We're encouraged to sing out joyfully, sing a new song to the Lord, play a new song on the lyre, whatever that is. Um, but praise God, sing a new song to him. Why? Because as verse 4 says, For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. This is an invitation to trust in God's promises to you. So, tell you a little story. My sister and her boyfriend Tom, they're really into rock climbing, really, really good at it. I did a little bit as a child, but they live in the Peak District, they go climbing every weekend. And one summer holiday, we were down in Cornwall, they invited me and my husband Henry to go rock climbing with them, which sounded fantastic, such an adventurous idea, I, I love it. Until the reality hit that we had to scramble down these rocks um, off the side of a cliff with our bags full of ropes and harnesses and chalk and little nuts to go in the wall. And you get to this ledge, this rock ledge against a cliff face. And off the ledge is the raging sea. So you kind of sit there thinking, if I fall off that cliff, I'm going to end up in the sea. Not a good scenario. And uh, so we got there. We were checking out the surroundings. Tom is probably the most experienced climber. So he started climbing up the wall, attached with his harness, with his rope, and he was gonna set the climb. So the way he does this is he gets these little torque nuts, I think they're called, um, and he finds little cracks in the rock to put these nuts in that kind of then hold you onto the rock face. He climbs all the way up, gets to the top, 
attaches himself to a big boulder, or so you, so you hope, and then he throws the rope back down the cliff, you strap yourself in, and off you go. And with this type of climbing, Tom's at the top, and he's kind of hoisting you up the wall as you climb. And the thing with this is once you start climbing, um, you can't actually see Tom. You know that he's there. You can feel that there's someone on the other end of the rope, but you can't see him. And there's moments of the climb where you actually feel like you're climbing a little bit further up the wall than he's pulling you. So there's this bit of slack. So it's kind of, you start thinking, right, if I let go of this, I'm plummeting. Um, and this particular route we were climbing, I was, I began fairly confident, but there was this section about halfway up, and I'm gonna say very high, um, very, very high. Imagine I'm high up on the cliff face. And the, the only way to climb this bit of rock face is to essentially wedge yourself in a crack in the wall. And I'm not kidding, you just kind of have to like slither your way up this wedge in the wall like this. And I got to this point and my arms were aching, my legs were aching, my feet hurt, my fingers hurt from holding onto this rock face. And I could just feel in myself that I was not strong enough to keep myself on the cliff wall. And I started kind of sliding down this crack in the wall. Uh, it, wasn't a pretty sight, it wasn't a pretty sight by any means. And panic started to set in. And I shouted up to Tom, Tom, I'm gonna fall. And I could just hear this voice, no, Hannah, don't worry, I've got you. I was like, no, I will, I can feel myself slipping. No, don't worry, Hannah, I've got you, I've got you. You're not gonna fall, I won't let you fall. You're safe to let go. And I'd come to the end of my own strength. I had no choice, no other choice, but to trust that Tom would come good on his word. That if I let go of the cliff face, I wasn't going to plummet to my death. And sure enough, the moment came where I couldn't hold on any longer and I let go and just swung exactly where I was. When I couldn't do it myself, I had to trust Tom. And I could trust Tom's word because he was an experienced climber. He wasn't gonna let me fall because he knew the route that he had set himself. He paid attention to my every move and he promised me that he wouldn't let me fall and he came good on his word. And in the Passion Translation of the Bible, verse four that we've read just a moment ago declares, God is true to his promises. His word can be trusted and everything he does is reliable and right. Because God's promises reveal who he is. And these promises can be found in the Bible. The Bible is just full of promises to you. Just wanna read some of the promises um, that God speaks over you that you can trust in. The Bible says that he is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. He gives strength to the weary. He increases the power of the weak. He goes before you and he will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He promises that his peace that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. He promises to do immeasurably more than you could ever ask for or imagine. And he's able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And these are just some of the thousands of promises that God makes to you. So when you feel overwhelmed, when you feel like you're struggling to keep your head above water, trust in his promises to you. And secondly, we can trust in his grace over you. The thing about imposter syndrome is it's actually slightly true. Psalm 33 verses 16 to 17 remind us that it's actually been true for generations. It says, no king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its strength, it cannot save. Because the truth is we are imposters, we are weak. That's the reality, but it's not a limitation to God. And in the New Testament, in the Bible, after the stories of Jesus, St. Paul writes of his own weakness. He says, but Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. This is radical. The pressure is off. 
the, your brokenness and your weakness is not something to be hidden or to be afraid of. In fact, it says gladly rejoice in it. We can own it. We can claim it. You know, that means I have the freedom. <laughs> there is grace. You know, I'm a reverend and I have doubts some days, but his grace is sufficient. Sometimes, confession, I pretend I haven't seen someone in the street because... I can't be bothered to have a conversation with them. But his grace is sufficient. I've also eaten some of my husband's Easter egg, even though he told me specifically not to. But his grace is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient. His power is made perfect in your weakness. So we can trust in his grace over us. You can trust in his grace over you. And finally, trust in his love for you. Psalm 33 ends with a declaration. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. It ends with this picture of unfailing love. And the thing is, whilst we try and hide our weakness and hold it all together, to put on a brave face, to fake it until we make it, Jesus does the exact opposite. He makes himself weak out of his great love for us. So again, in the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Philippians 2 one of my favorite passages in the Bible says, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That is the gospel. That is the God that we worship. God himself, divinity, glory, power, wonder, became like us to show us that we don't need to fake it to be loved. The gospel of Jesus is that he would become what he was not. The king comes to serve. He exchanges the riches of heaven for the squalor of a stable. The creator is made subject to his creation. The holy one taking on the sin of the world on a criminal's cross because he loves us. And it is because of his death on the cross. The Bible says that we have an inheritance. It uses this language of an inheritance. And that means what we know of an inheritance that we get to share in what is to come. The language that's used is that we're co-heirs with Christ. Everything that is available to Jesus, the Son of God, is made available to us because he loves us. He has made all the resources of heaven available to you because he loves you. We have a share in his glory. We have a share in his goodness. We have a share in his power because he loves us. And it is real. His love is real and it is powerful and it changes everything. When we get that we are loved, it changes everything. So trust in his love for you. And so really, it's all just about putting our trust in the one who is totally trustworthy. And so next time you catch yourself shrinking back or hiding away, when you feel your strength failing, when the loudest voice that you can hear is the one that tells you that you are not good enough, just stop and remember and trust. Trust in his promises to you, trust in his grace over you, and trust in his love for you. Amen. <laughs>